be the change you want to see. Make a difference by giving your money a purpose, a mission to do good. Welcome to Money with Mission, where we talk to individuals, businesses, and organizations who are taking the lead and whose actions are impacting the well-being of their communities and the world at large. Welcome back to Money with Mission. Today I have a friend of mine, Mauricio Raul. Mauricio is known as one of the few lawyers that actually speaks English. He is one of the premier syndication attorneys in the country, helping real estate syndicators raise hundreds of millions of dollars to pursue their dreams of financial independence. But don't leave, because he can also talk to passive investors. He is the founder and CEO of Premier Law Group and spends 100% of his practice on syndications for real estate investors. With almost 20 years of securities experience, Mauricio specializes in Reg D exempt offerings, don't leave, it's not going to be that technical, and educates investors from around the world on how to navigate the complex world of securities laws. <clears throat> He's an educator at heart. He regularly travels around the country speaking to real estate investors and entrepreneurs, educating them about how syndication legally fit how the syndication legal piece fits into the overall syndication puzzle. He regularly contributes to the Real Estate Guys radio show, has been featured on the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate, the Ken McElroy podcast, and the best real estate show ever, among countless others. He graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, obtained his doctorate, Juris Doctorate degree at Loyola in Los Angeles, and lives in Southern California with his wife and two beautiful daughters. Adeline and Alessandra. Welcome, Mauricio. It's good to see you. Friend, it's been a while. You're looking it's, good. It's been a long while. Yeah. Mauricio and I used to run into each other all the time at meetings. And last year, since there were no meetings, we didn't run into each other. Yeah, and yeah. this year, we've been on different circuits for some reason. But we'll get together again soon. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Looking forward to it. Welcome. So most of the investors that we have, most of the people that listen to my podcast are passive investors. So I have people who are looking to invest, figure out what to do with their money or, or on the sidelines trying to understand it and want to know, you know, how do I make sure everything's going to be okay? How do I know who this person is? How do I know they're not going to steal my money? And one of the things I always talk about is you don't want to invest with just anybody. You don't give your, put your money in a suitcase and hand it off to somebody like you do your 401k. Um, so talk to them about how to know who they're working with. Yeah, and I think even before that, you know, I was just thinking of our good mutual friend, uh, Robert Helms. He always talks to us about, you know, everyone's personal investment philosophy, you know, and I think that's where it starts for even for passive investors. Is this something that, first of all, obviously we're talking, you know, real estate and, and, and hard assets. Is this, is this an area that you're interested in? And if so, do you want to be actively involved in, you know, in like a, I think Robert said toilet tenants and, you know, cockroaches or whatever it is that you have do you want to be involved in that do you want to get the phone call in the middle of the night to go clean the toilets or do you want to invest passively through someone who knows what they're doing and can actually do all that sort of quote unquote dirty work for you and you just kind of write a check and sit back and, and watch somebody else do all the work so that's probably the first question you got to ask yourself is well, what do you want to do do you want to actively participate or do you, do you want to start learning and, and and finding out every single little thing about the particular asset you're interested in or do you want to find someone an expert like yourself that knows what they're doing, that have been doing it for many, many years, and you kind of get to ride that that coattail, that that gravy train, and, and you're just kind of contributing the capital piece, and you get home to sit, to go sit down on your couch and, and wait for those those re uh, returns to come in. Yeah. But w once you've made that decision, assuming you've decided that, hey, I want to be passively, you know, I've got my day job, right? I've got a, I've got my regular job, whether it's another business or a W two, I don't have time to go, you know, fly around the country, you know, putting together teams and all of these. Um, in all of these um, markets or, or, or doing due diligence, or I don't know how to do due diligence. Uh, I think by far the number one thing that a passive investor has to um, come to terms with is, is the sponsor themselves, right? Who are you investing with? And is that person or group of people uh, able to execute whatever game plan they're, they're telling you, whatever their business plan? Because it's very easy for anybody to put together a nice little glossy brochure about you know whatever they're investing in and how it's going to be great and all this stuff but if they don't have the experience or the team or, or the integrity to actually execute it it doesn't really matter you could have the greatest passive investment in the, in the history of the world and if it has a substandard sponsor it doesn't matter it's not going to work and conversely you could take a deal that's maybe not great but if you have a really outstanding sponsor they can actually make something out of it so to me the due diligence on the sponsor uh, is always sort of the, the 
is paramount for a passive investor and, and dig in there and find out, you know, do they have a track record or, or at least somebody on their team have a track record on the specific asset that they're investing in? Uh, do they have a team? Do they have you know, experience? Um, all those things uh, is, is by far the number one thing a passive investor should look for. So when you're talking, when you say, and I want to just make sure we don't leave anybody behind, the sponsor is the person who is do, putting the deal together. They are the person who went out and met people, found this piece of real estate, found this business, whatever it is we're going to invest in and put that deal together. Whether they're going to run it or not is a, another question altogether, but they are managing your money, basically, is what they're doing. So that they are called the sponsor. Yeah. Yeah, and to use my analogy on the jigsaw puzzle, you know, I always talk about because I'm the syndication, I'm the legal piece, but it's really a puzzle. It's a really a jigsaw puzzle that somebody, and that's who the sponsor is, somebody or a group of people are putting all those jigsaw puzzle pieces together. So somebody's, you know, in charge of, uh, you know, finding the right market to go invest. Somebody is in charge of finding the right team inside that market to, you know, the, the brokers and the property managers and the, and the agents and all that stuff. Somebody else is doing underwriting. Somebody's doing due diligence. Somebody's doing asset management. Somebody's dealing with the lawyers. Somebody's dealing with the CPAs. I mean, there's so many different things that you're doing and, and the, the person or group of people that are doing that is what we affectionately, not affectionately call, that's what we call the sponsor uh, of the syndication. You'll also hear a term like a, a GP or a general partner. That's kind of a popular vernacular that we use where the GP is the one that's kind of organizing and running the show. And then the LPs, the limited partners are the past investors who are not involved in, in the activities that are simply providing the capital. So they're writing a check and then giving that to the GP or the sponsor, and they're gonna take that and, and, and go execute on their business plan. So thank you, Mauricio, that was really good. Is there, as a passive investor, I started thinking, well, how much should I invest in a deal? Is it worth that? How do they, how should you look at a deal to figure out if they're asking for the right amount of money? Or are they gonna be, how do, you, how do you know that there's enough? Or I know there's sometimes in paperwork, there's gonna be a capital call. I might have to put in more money. How do you know? Or how can you get a better understanding of, of what's happening with your money? Yeah, I mean, that, that's partly why it's so important to make sure you're vetting the sponsor and that they have the experience and, and know what they're doing, because they're the ones that really have the, 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 the knowing about what's really going on in the deal. But as a passive investor, you have the right to ask all kinds of questions and ask for documents. Yeah. There should be in the documentation that you're provided as, as a passive investor, uh, a section called sort of the sources and uses of, of proceeds, right? So. Mm -hmm. Sponsor may say, I'm raising a million dollars to go do X. Well, you can, there should be a breakdown of what that million dollars is going to go to. Primarily, it's going to be the down payment of whatever the property is. But if they're going to do some kind of value add or some improvements to the property, there'll be a breakdown on, you know, what that, what that looks like. And I would say that generally, um, I would say ballpark, the amount of capital that's required usually is about a third. So take the property value, let's say you're buying a $3 million building. Uh, between down payments, value add, and all that stuff, generally you're going to need about a third of that or a million dollars to do whatever. Now, of, of course, if it's a really heavily intensive a value add, it might be more. If you're buying right. something that's pretty cash, it'll be less. But if you want to have the ballpark, uh, that's one of the things. And then the other thing you want to look at is just from the there. You, you typically are also pre presented with a, a, a you know a pro forma, sort of what the projections are going to be year after year. And I think another good rule of thumb there is you know is to look at the expense side. So the revenue. I don't want to say it's easier, but revenue, you can look at what their assumption, but most people focus on the revenue and it's a little bit easier because they'll, they'll tell you, look, this is what the, the rents in this market are going for, right? And they're going to, they're going to tell you what that is. The sponsor is going to tell you, look, the market rents in this place are a thousand dollars a month. Now you could go do your own due diligence and check. You could start calling, you, you can go on the internet probably and just go check out whether the two bedroom, three bath is actually going for a thousand dollars in that network, or you can call some property managers and find out, but they're going to tell you what that, what that number is. So let's say it's a thousand. Then they're going to tell you what it's currently at. Right. And again, you could ask for documentation there, but it's, there's going to be a, a Delta, you know, they're, they're currently getting 800, but the market's a, th a thousand. So there's $200 there that potentially you could increase the rents. The problem is of course, that the, the, the people getting a thousand is because the level of the property is at a thousand dollar level and your property is not at that yet. And that's right. the whole idea of, of, of spending the money to bring that property up. But these are all little things that you can, you know, you can double check if you wanted to, if, if you're not, you know, again, the easiest way out of this is just to go with somebody that you trust and that you, that, that you, that you know well and who has a good track record. Maybe, you, maybe you've invested several times with that person and you trust that person. But if not, if it's the first time you've met them, it's the first time that, um, that you're investing with them, then 
it does take a little bit of education. I mean, you've got to, you know, there are definitely some courses you can take out, just some basic, basic stuff. But to me, those are the, the those are the things I would be looking at because again, anybody can put numbers on a spreadsheet, but at the end of the day, what the market rents are what the market rents are, right? You, you can find that information out. Uh, what the current, the actual real rents are, you can find out what those are because there's going to be some, you know, there's going to be rent rolls and stuff like that. Uh, and then on expenses, I would just say, look, it's going to usually, you know, anywhere about, you know, this probably better than I do, uh, Felicia, but I would say maybe 40% expense ratio is kind of the ballpark, maybe a little bit less. But if they're saying that my expense ratio is going to be 20%, that's going to be a little bit of a red flag. And so you may end up with more expenses and therefore less cash flow. Um, but, you know, again, the, the, a little bit of education goes a long way, but, but again, I, I'm always going to go back, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but going back to just, just feeling comfortable with, with the sponsor and, and calling the references. And again, if you haven't invested with that person, because right. it's always going to be a first time, right? Like once you're in deal number two, three, four, five, you're going to get to a point where you trust this person. But if you, if you, if this is your first investment, there are ways that you can uh, double check all your numbers and, and then you can make your own. You know, you don't have to agree with all the assumptions. I mean, the sponsor is going to make a lot of assumptions to get you from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. You're more than welcome to challenge those assumptions. What right? I always tell people that my job as a securities attorney is to make sure that all this information is available to the passive investor. So from that perspective, that's maybe another, uh, another uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little checks and balances kind of thing where it is legal requirement to provide all the information to the passive investors so that they can make an intelligent decision as to whether this is a good investment or not. So my job is to make sure not only that all the information is provided, but also that it's accurate, yeah. right? So, so that's, that's, that's a piece that you can start looking at in terms of what's in the documentation. But um, that, that to me is probably the, again, if, you, if, you, if it's the first time you've done something with the, with the sponsor, then just take a look at the numbers, uh, do a little bit of research to find out, you know, what's, how do they getting from point out the assumption? Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. So you're going from point A to point B. You're making a lot of assumptions and you can challenge those assumptions. You know, maybe the sponsor is saying, hey, once we get rents to whatever the market is, they're going to go up 5% for the next five years. You may disagree with that. You may say, well, I don't know about 5%. I, I think there's going to be another lockdown and we're going to have 0%. And so you can, you can mess with the numbers and then you can come out and say, hey, look, it's still a good deal. It's even if the rents don't go up or what's my yeah. worst. You can mess around with those. Occupancy is another big thing. You know, they'll tell you what the occupancy is today and they'll tell you what the occupancy is in the market and they've got to get there. And you can make your assumptions that maybe it's not going to take a year to get there. Maybe it's going to take five years. Maybe, you know, you can mess around with those assumptions. That's one of the benefits of, of doing a, a deal specific investment is that you can look at all these numbers, look at all the assumptions, which the attorney is going to make sure are in there. And then you can cut them in half. You can discount them. You can do whatever you want. One, some things you said there are really important to me is that the sponsor comes to a securities attorney to put together their paperwork for their deal. And the good securities attorney like Mauricio is gonna make sure that what I'm thinking as a sponsor makes sense. He's gonna push me, push me, push me, make sure that everything I'm saying to him is makes, makes sense. And then when somebody really looks at it, it'll fly and not just write down. So as I say, it's gonna be 100% return on investment in two days. I mean, he's going to come on, please. Yeah, he, he, Mauricio would not let that fly. <laughs> just right. and, that's, yeah. and that's one of the other sort of red flags or if you're going through like maybe a checklist that I sometimes think of and in my mind where, you know, maybe the first checklist is, you know, work with the sponsor, make sure that you, you vet the sponsor, do your due diligence on the sponsor. The other part is, is looking at the documentation that the sponsor is giving you because if they're a reputable sponsor, they're going to be working with a securities attorney, right? So mm -hmm. if there's no securities attorney anywhere to be found, that's going to be a red flag. Right, that's to be red flag number one is like, where's the attorney? Where's it? Who is the attorney? Mo I don't know how to say most attorneys, at least in our firm, we always offer for the sponsors. If, if the investors have questions, legal questions, to just eat, shoot, shoot us an email or give us a call and we'll be happy to answer those. If there's no securities attorney involved, that might be a little bit of a red flag. Uh, but the documentation you should be receiving, as you've seen these, Felicia, you know, a pretty big stack of, of legal disclosure documents, right? right. Um, and if you don't see those, that's another red flag. If all you get is a pretty, you know, brochure and then, hey, send a check to this address, that's another red flag. You want to make sure there's a big disclosure. Most, most syndicators will provide what's called a PPM, a private placement memorandum. And in fact, those are required if any of the investors are non-accredited. And I'll get back to what that is in a second. But if you're a non-accredited investor, then you are, the sponsor is required to give you a PPM, a private placement memorandum, which is li literally a document 
that goes through not only all of the material information, important information about the deal, but all the way your deals can go south, right? You, you, that's my job. My job is to look at your deal and say, okay, this, this could go wrong. This could go wrong. We could have another recession. You know, rents might go negative as opposed to going up, you know, whatever the world war three could start, you know, who yeah. knows? I'm going to give them all. Some of them we didn't know like COVID for example. Now we've got the disclosure and, you know, COVID who knows if it's going to come back, if it's part two, part three, if it's a different thing. But if you don't see that, those documents, that's going to be a huge red flag. And, and, and going back to my initial thing of a non-accredited, we, in the securities world, we separate for good or for bad, we separate investors into two main categories. One are the accredited investors, which are, for the most part now, there was a new update recently, but for the most part, it's based on your income or net worth. So if you have a million dollars in net worth, excluding your primary residence, you are an accredited investor. Or if you earn $200,000 a year or have earned $200,000 a year for the last two years, with a reasonable expectation of earning $200,000 or more this year, you're also an accredited investor. And so if you're not an accredited investor, which a lot of times that's, that's pretty common to have non-accredited investors, you have to see these offering docs, PPM, private place memorandum. Best way I can describe, I kind of gave a little bit of a, of a preview of what a PPM is, but my favorite analogy is the medical consent form. And you know, you coming from, from the medical yeah. field, Alicia. So, you know, I've gone, I've had many, many procedures, especially with my teeth. I have horrible teeth. And so I go to the oral surgeon quite a, quite a few times to get wisdom teeth pulled or whatever. And they put me under for like five seconds, right, to pull it all out. But prior to putting me under, they give you that little yellow sheet, that medical consent form, and they give it to you if you go to surgery, and it just lists all the ways your procedure can go wrong. In my case, to get my teeth pulled, I could have some bleeding, I could have some, you know, an infection, some swelling, I could die from this procedure, you know, all, and you just review them, you sign, the doctor signs, and then you're off to the races. Same thing with the PPM. The PPM is all the ways the deal can go wrong. You're just disclosing all the risks. And then you just sign off on the document. Everybody signs off and everybody agrees. We understand what the risks are. And my job is just to make sure that I'm properly articulating all the risks. So that's what the PPM is. And that's something you definitely should be getting if you or anybody else that you know in the deal are non-accredited. And, and honestly, even when they are accredited, it's pretty common practice to put one of those together as well. Yeah. Money with Mission is a real estate and business investment company that specializes in finding projects that have the potential to give you a great return on your investment dollar and make an impact in the communities where we invest. Make a difference in your life and the lives of others. Go to moneywithmission.com to learn more. So a lot of investors get and I know I did even as a sponsor, the first time I got my first PPM, it was intimidating to me. So all it's like 80 something pages after you've already had a conversation and you're like, oh yeah, that sounds like a really good deal. Then you get this 80 page thing. It's like, oh my God, what is this? Is yeah. there a particular way that you should approach that as a passive investor? Do, you, do I need to read every page of that doggone thing? You should absolutely read every single page of that. Or, or what you can do, and they're not super expensive, uh, but there are, there are lawyers out there and I can certainly help your audience to get in touch with some of them. For, I'm gonna say ballpark $1,000 or maybe a little bit less, uh, we'll actually review the PPM on your behalf. So you'll give them a call, you'll tell them, hey, I'm investing in this deal. This is my understanding of the deal. I don't know, I've got these 100 page document. I don't know what any of this means. Can you review that and let me know that it reflects what my understanding are? And then typically you get on a phone call with the attorney says, hey, here are some provisions that I don't know if you knew about them, but here's what they're saying about this, this, is this. And then you'd be like, yeah, that's what I understood. That's fine. Or, oh, I didn't know that. And so having a lawyer, I always think, you know, sort of that, that ounce of prevention, uh, even though it, it does cost you $1,000, you know, a thousand dollars before you spend, you know, 50 or a hundred is, is probably money well spent unless, yeah. unless you've done this over and over again. Yep. I agree a hundred percent. I didn't know there were attorneys who would review that for, uh, I think that's a fairly low price, especially what you're about to invest. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's a good idea, especially if you've never done it before, have somebody go over that with you. So you understand exactly what you're signing. Cause it's a lot, it's an intimidating. If you read a medical consent and so many people don't read them, but when you read it, it gets kind of scary, even though it is a page or page and a half. There's a lot of stuff in there. This is at least 80 pages worth of stuff that you can start to get confusing. There's, there's terms in there. There's Even though there's five pages of explanation, explanation of what the terms mean, you're still at the end going, what the heck is this talking about? <laughs> you know, you're going to get that glossy brochure, right? The, what we call the, the pitch deck or the yeah. executive summary or the business plan. And it's got pretty pictures. And that typically reflects the rosier side of things. And this is what we plan on doing. We're super excited. Everything's going to go great. And here's our results. And we're, everybody's going to make a bunch of money. 
but the PPM is the kind of the reverse of that. So I always joke with my clients, I look, you've got to do a really good job on the business plan because once they get a hold of my PPM, they're going to get a little scared and you're going to lose yeah. a little bit. So you've got to kind of over, yeah. over deliver on the business plan. So when they get a little bit scared and come back, they're still, they still like the deal because I'm going to tell them all the ways they can lose their money. Uh, and I'm definitely going to make sure that all of the, you know, all the important information, what we call the material facts are there. And, and as important that we're not leaving out any important facts, you know, because a lot of times yeah. people will, will say something and then not say something. And the, the not saying something sometimes is just as important or more important than, than, than saying something. So that's mm. what the securities attorney is for. Mm. So when you don't see a securities attorney, that's going to be a huge red flag uh, for you as a passive investor. So do you need, is it a securities attorney who would review that for you or can you have yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I used to do that, you know, back in the day, you know, usually for my clients, I would do a review and it would take me, I don't know, two or three hours between reviewing the docs and then having, I would usually have two calls with the client, one on the front end to let, so that they could tell me what their understanding of the deal is. Then I would review it and then go back to them and say, you know, whatever your understanding was wrong or, or whatever. But yeah. then I'll say, hey, check it here. The, you know, I've highlighted some provisions that are, you know, not really standard. I just want to make sure you're aware of them. Um, and so, yeah, so it is a security attorney and they'll, they'll probably end up spending two or three or maybe four hours on it. So again, it just depends on what their hourly rate is. So, you know, usually, you know, these attorneys are in that 250 to 400 range. So it just depends on what they charge, but it, it's about a thousand dollars and you may even be able to get some cheaper. That's really good. So to find one of those people, well, do you have a list or how would you just, do you just find a security attorney and call them up and ask? Them I, I, I've do? got a couple. So if you want to have, okay. and I can give it, I can just give that, con if you, well, I want to make sure I get their person's permission to just before yeah. I blast out there, but no you can reach out to, to me and then I can make an intro or I can check with this person and just be like, Hey, is it okay if I give your contact info? And I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy to, to, to do that. Let's do this. So if anybody out there has a deal they're looking at and they're thinking about doing something, and you're listening to this podcast, you can go to Money With Mission and send me an email and I can get you in touch with Maurizio and we'll be, you'll be able to get in touch with somebody that way. And that'll be, the, that's probably the most direct way to do it. Agreed. This has been really good. Anything else you can think of that passive investors need to know? Getting the documents is, is one thing, right? So, so that's a big red flag when you don't. And I've got so many horror stories, not so many, I, that's exaggeration. I've got a couple because I, 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 I did it for a little bit, but there's a lot of horror stories where people did not get PPMs and so I kind of gave them the heads up, I'm like, hey, where's the PPM? And they're like, well, they didn't give me one. And I'm like, well, are you accredited? Like, no. I'm like, okay, well, th these are all kind of red flags. Yeah. And they went ahead anyway, because, hey, I'm, we're here just to give advice. And the ultimate decision is up to the investor. And they went ahead and did. And, and sure, sure enough, two years later, they, they call me back and say, there was some fraud. One, there was a, a fraud thing involved. The other one, I can't remember what the other issue was, but yeah. there's always issues. So those are really big red flags. The other thing you want to be aware of too, though, is you're going to be receiving several documents. So the PPM is kind of the main disclosure document, but those, there's also the operating agreement, for example, in those docs, which oh, yes. is actually the, the operating agreement of the LLC. Usually it's an LLC that you're investing in. And that outlines all the procedures that happen within the business, right? And so everything that the sponsor is telling you ultimately has to be in that operating agreement. If they're promising you, you know, 80% of the profits, well, that's going to be in the operating agreement. If they're going to give you some kind of preferred return, that's going to be in the, you know, it's also going to be in the PPM as a disclosure, but the actual document where the rules are done or in the operating agreement. So one of the things you want to be careful about and make sure you're, you're reviewing, and this is something you're, the attorney that I'm talking about would do, is making sure that they match. That if whatever's in the, whatever's in the PPM and also whatever's in the business plan is actually in the operating agreement. Because if it's not in the operating agreement, you've got a problem because they can be promising you, you know, like I said, maybe it's an 8% preferred return uh, and it's in the business plan and it's in these PPM, but if it's not in the operating agreement, the operating agreement is ultimately what's going to what's going to fly mm. from a standpoint. So just making sure that everything matches up. And again, I think that's something another reason why you may want to have an attorney take a look at it. because That's something that they would definitely look for. I would never think that those things would not be the same. So I guess I've always used a good securities attorney to get my to our paperwork. <laughs> Again, it depends. You know, a lot of these are some of these are, are somewhat templated, so they'll, they'll always start with this, with some sort of a base template, uh -huh. and so they're always sort of starting the template and they're building on it. Yeah. And so if you just get, didn't get around to you know putting that preferred return language, or maybe you put it's supposed to be an eight percent and you just left the seven percent or six percent or whatever, you got confused. I mean, these attorneys obviously we do a lot of different deals, and so yeah, maybe they got confused. And and usually you know the client review, you know our client, the sponsor will review it, but sometimes it gets missed there too. So yeah. Some other things i have seen that actually but i caught it so yeah I, I do understand that and after so you have the ppm you have the operating agreement those two things usually come together and then 
there's a subscription agreement. A subscription agreement, which is kind of like the official document that gets you into the deal. So that once you review all the docs, you're gonna you're gonna fill out, you know, how how much money you want to invest, how many shares you're gonna have, if there's different classes of shares, which class do you want in, uh, a couple of representations, and then you sign. And then when the sponsor countersigns, and that's really kind of the legally binding document that says, okay, I've officially invested. So that you'll see that as well. So you'll see a PPM, an operating agreement, a subscription agreement. You'll also see an investor questionnaire. Uh, mm -hmm. because the sponsor may or may not have some limitations on how many investors they can bring in or how many accredited and how many non-accredited. So that, that's one way to keep track. In certain situations, they may actually be required to verify your accreditation status. They may look for your tax returns or your W-2s or your 1099s. So the questionnaire is a way for, for the client, for the sponsors to just keep track of that stuff and also get some you know, basic information for tax filings, like what's your social security number, your EIN or your you know, bank account, whatever, all that information. So that's always in there, a subscription agreement. And then usually your business plan, which again is mostly from the sponsor, not, not much of a legal document, but the, the business plan then is kind of like that last document at the end of the PPM uh, that, that's sort of the marketing, what I would call the marketing package, which you probably have already seen. Uh, maybe, but that's another thing to keep in mind is, you know, you may have seen a, an original version of that business plan, but again, the one that comes with the PPM that's attached to the PPM, or what I call the sort of the offering documents, that's the real business plan. So business plans evolve over time, like a business plan that, that, that that's available at the beginning may change because maybe the lender changed some of the terms or maybe they find something out or they change the numbers or they have less investor, or whatever it is. So you want to make sure that maybe at the very least you just ask the sponsor, hey, is this business plan that you sent me today, is that the same one that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago or, or, or are there any changes? Uh, and they should, they should tell you that because um, in my in my ideal world, there's no people, there's no business plan that goes out before I look at it and and, and that me and the client approve it, and so it should really only be one version of it. But it's not uncommon for sponsors to to uh, jump the gun a little bit, let's say, and, and send that out before I look at it. And so by the time I look at it, and make some changes, add some disclaimers, you know, maybe make some disclosures in that in that business plan. There there may be a different version. So just make sure that the final version is the same version that you've been looking at and relying on. And if it's not, you just ask questions about that to say, why yeah, is it? Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, sometimes it changes. I mean, you know, for example, I mean, it's not, I mean, this is not uncommon that you may, what we call underwrite, you may, you may come up with the assumptions and the, and the, and the, and the returns based on, let's just say, 80% um, loan to value, that the bank is going to loan you 80% of the purchase price. And then it turns out a week before close or two weeks before close, like, you know what, we're only going to give you 75%. So now you've got to raise additional money and that may reduce your, you know, your projected returns, right? right. Um, and most of the time, that's not a huge number. I mean, you know, maybe instead of getting a, an eight and a half percent, you're going to get an 8.45%. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't call it yeah. material, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's, there was a huge assumption in there that the, the lender was going to maybe even, you know, um, lend on maybe some of the value add or they were going to do something that you assumed and then, the interest rate may have changed, the terms may have changed, the, you know, and that, that, that could significantly change the numbers even. So, um, or maybe they decided to increase or decrease their fees. You know, maybe they yeah. started with a, a 5% or 2% acquisition fee and now it's 5%, you know, whatever. It, it, a lot can happen between the first draft and the, and the final that when it's done. Yeah. So once you, as a passive investor, you've, you're just like, I'm doing it. You sign your paperwork, you send your money in. What paperwork should you have to prove that you're in this deal? What should I, what should I get back? Yeah, so you typically in sponsors, you're not gonna get, this is not a corporation, right? So you're typically not gonna see anything like a stock certificate, like shares in a company. Like if you, if you buy shares of Apple, even though you don't actually get them, somebody has Apple stock, right? And you actually have a, a certificate. I've seen some LLC membership certificates, but that's, I'm not even sure that's even technically correct uh, because LLCs don't have, owners, they just have members. So there's a membership in this LLC. So the way you prove membership is twofold. The main one is the operating agreement. So the operating agreement will list at the end of the operating agreement, all of the investors and the amount that they've invested and what percentage ownership they have in the deal. Uh, that not only is it for purposes of voting, right? If everybody's going to vote on something, everybody needs to know, well, who's, who's, who's allowed to vote? What what kind of voting do I have? Do I have one vote, 10 votes? What percentage ownership do I have? Uh, but also if the bank is asking for you, hey, you, you know, maybe you're getting a loan on a home or something. They're saying, you know, hey, I own $50,000 of this of this company. The operating agreement is going to be one, one mechanism that you can show. Uh, and then eventually after the first year goes by, you're actually going to get a, a tax document, a K-1 
from the sponsor. And that's K1 is what you're going to give to your CPA. So the CPA can put it on your tax return. But that K1 will also show what ownership percentage you have in the, in the LLC. So that's another way you can think. And the last thing you're going to have, um, so you're going to have a countersigned operating agreement. You should have, but by the time all everything is done, and this sometimes falls behind. So this is something I would proactively request. Once the deal is over and they've raised all the money and they've closed on the property, I would ask them for a fully executed copy of the operating agreement, which not only has your signature, but also has the sponsor signature as well. And then a full copy of that exhibit that lists all of the uh, members, because mm -hmm. that will tell you, you know, will, will tell you, it'll show you what your ownership percentage is there. Uh, and then you're going to get a, a countersigned copy of the subscription agreement that typically is the, the legally binding document. So it'll show you that, hey, uh, I'm subscribing for, let's say, $50,000. Uh, although the subscription agreement won't necessarily tell you what ownership percentage you have, it'll just say how much you're investing. The exhibit one is going to show you what percentage you own, 1.74% of the okay. company. So that, yeah. that plus the K1 will, uh, will prove your ownership. Okay. But you have to have that because if, K, if your sponsor's not, doesn't have the most integrity, you may not get a K1 if you don't prove that you... I mean, that just it can get real. Uh, the K1, you're, I was going to say, and it's not an integrity thing, it's not uncommon for sponsors to either, you know, they've got so much going on, they may not end up sending out the final exhibit exhibit with all the ownership. Yes. So that's something you just request, hey, you know, can do you mind sending me, sending yeah. me a copy? Uh, at least with yours, at the very least have your, uh, although again, from, a, from an investor standpoint, you know, if you wanna usually have some voting rights, especially if there's something really big that needs to happen. And so you need a mechanism for you to go give notice to everybody and, and, and figure out who, who has the right to vote. So really you should be getting that exhibit with all the, with all the members, but at least your membership. Um, the K-1s you, I mean, if, if, if a sponsor is not giving you a K-1, that's a big red flag there as well, because yeah. you know, that's just a basic requirement. First of all, there'd be a violation of the operating agreement, because again, that's where all the rules are. And the operating agreement clearly states that within a certain amount of time after the end of the year, um, you're, you, they need to provide you with you know, the, 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 the prior year's K-1, because you, you have to be able to, um, to file your taxes and your taxes are due you know, April 15th, right? right? Now, to be fair, just so everybody's aware, it's very common for business owners to, to extend that. So even though as a business, actually your, your taxes are due in March, they typically extend them. And a lot of the sponsors will do the same. So you may not get a K-1. If you're investing in a syndication, there's a good chance you may need to do an extension as well and file your taxes in August or September of the year, because you're not going to get your K-1 maybe until after that initial thing, but they should definitely be giving you a K-1. If they're not, that's a huge red flag. That definitely. And thanks for saying that thing about K-1s not always coming before April, because I was about to say, okay, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I don't have a policy. I mean, I've talked to, uh, you know, my CPA firm actually is a, is a well-known CPA firm and represents a lot of syndicators. And it's just, it's automatic. They just, they, they don't file on March 15th. They're going to file all in, in September, I guess, whatever the math is, September 15th, September. Uh, because it's, it's just a huge, it's not like your personal taxes where you're like, oh, here's my W-2 and here are my standard deduction. I mean, this oh, wow. is a massive, you know, sometimes there's 30, 40, 50 oh, wow. investors and it's, yeah. it's, it's a multifamily building and it's very complex. And sometimes you don't, as the sponsor, as a CPA for the spot, you don't even get all the information in time. So it's almost like an automatic standing extension. So if you're, if, look, if you're going to invest in syndications, you're, you're, you're jumping into the next level. You know, there's a good chance that you're no longer, you're not going to be able to file a 1040 EZ anymore if you have a syndication deal, right? Now right. you're going to be, you're going to file it the 1040, right? Um, and, and, you know, even though you may have typically, you know, filed your taxes, you know, on time on, on, on April 15th every year, there's a good chance you're going to start doing extensions and, and filing it in, 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 in October so that you can get all your K-1s. That's, that's a big thing because I think a lot of people have, at least have in, who have invested with me didn't get that and I didn't think about it because I always extend and so there's been a lot of conversation around that so that's really important to know that once you start investing in syndications your your tax filing may very well change and it's a it's a conversation and something to really understand yeah, and I think it's good for a good practice for for sponsors in general too and I, re, I remind my clients as well is you know communication is always key so just give them the heads up early the earlier you can communicate with that them and hey you know welcome to this new deal FYI there's a good chance we will extend because of and you can give them all the reasons and, and yeah. there's a lot of, it's not it's not because you're lazy and you don't have time it's because a lot of the information you need to prepare your tax return won't be available until March or April yeah. and you won't have the time to turn it around in a week or two. So you're, you're yeah. 
it's really based on, on advice of the of your tax professional that you're extending it. I really like it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mauricio, thanks a lot. This has been really good. I hope you guys got a lot of out of that lot out of that. If you're thinking about investing in a syndication, um, this is some good information. And Mauricio has something for you, um, a checklist for passive investors so that you can just run down that list and make sure you understand everything that your sponsor is telling you or can vet your deal a little bit better, vet your sponsor, which is really where you want to go, know who you're investing with. And you can go to moneywithmission.com to get that. Anything else, Mauricio? Mauricio's on Facebook. He does a lot of education. A lot of his stuff is geared towards syndicators. But once you go on there and start listening to what he said, it really is in plain English. So anybody can understand it. And it'll help you to be a better passive investor. That's how I feel about that. So I think yeah. it's really good. No, I agree. I think understanding even the basics of what, from a syndication standpoint, will help you as a passive investor understand what they're what they're facing and what they need to be providing you. So that way, you know what to wait, what to look for when it's time to get those documents. Hundred percent. Thank you so much, so much, Mauricio, and see you guys next time. You've been listening to Money with Mission. There are projects happening right now where you can make a great return while positively impacting the lives of others. To learn more about today's guests or to download seven steps to building resilient wealth for women, visit www.moneywithmission.com. I hope you enjoyed the interview and are inspired to give your money a mission. Until next time, send your investment dollars into the world to bring you a financial return and improve the lives of others.